All right, let me move you over so I can see you instead of looking sideways. And that Elizabeth's biography is in the handouts that's been sent. Um, but let me give you a little bit of tidbit about her, something that you would not find out if you did not attend this conference. She's from New Orleans. It's so rare to find someone from New Orleans that could talk that language for us. Also, the other thing is she, she has had many jobs. Again, look at the bio, but she works at the Allen County Public Library and they do classes. Elizabeth has done several lectures, not only for them, but other public libraries. One thing Elizabeth will be noted for, great handouts, great, great, great handouts. But also because she's on the staff at Allen County Public Library, and I encourage anyone that has not been to Mecca to go there, is she's also one of the consultants that if you have a problem, you can actually schedule one-on-one -on -one time with her. She's very, very knowledgeable, very friendly. Maybe if you bring her chocolate, she'll even be friendlier. Um, but anyways, I have heard this lecture that she's about to give. I've already making notes to listen for new items. And then I love to search my ancestors home because I do think it helps to add that flesh to the bone. But I also like to know the stories the walls will tell so who owned it before my ancestor as well? And that, so if these walls could talk, how to research your home, here's the lovely Elizabeth Hodges. Thank you, Kim, for such a, a warm welcome. Uh, I love researching houses. Uh, as you probably might see in my bio, I actually previously used to work at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. So that's kind of where my love for researching where people lived kind of started. But we're gonna jump in. Before we get started, I'm actually gonna turn my camera off so you're not distracted by me and you can just focus on all the detailed information on these slides. All right, so let's jump on in. So I just wanna talk a little briefly about why I like researching houses, right? So as a genealogist, we love stories, right? But what is a better story than a house or an apartment or just a building, really? And the statement that I have here on the slide kind of sums up my feelings pretty accurately, which is underneath every layer of paint, wallpaper, or linoleum flooring of every house or apartment building, there is a story of generations of people's lives that we have yet to uncover. Uh, I know in my own house, I'm always learning new things, not just from the records, but also just the house itself. So our game plan for today, we're going to look at important records, uh, what you should be looking for, what they can tell us. We'll talk a little bit about historical and local context clues, some physical clues you might learn from your building uh, or from your house. And I'm going to show you an example of how to build the story of your house and its residents using all these tools, using a specific house that's actually in my neighborhood that I have researched thoroughly. So step one, follow the paper trail. Now, following uh, Ari is a really difficult thing to do with her wonderful presentation on Sambor Maps. She touched on a lot of these things, you know, the census, the city directories, the Sambor Maps. We will talk about all of these. One thing I didn't include on this particular slide, uh, in addition to maps, census city directories, newspapers, deeds, wills, and probate is actually uh, title abstracts. Abstracts of title are wonderful to have if you have it. Not everyone does. Uh, I know of a couple of my neighbors, so I live in a historic neighborhood, which we'll talk about. A couple of my neighbors have their abstracts of title. I don't, I wish I did. So we're gonna talk about how to basically create a train of, chain of title uh, without having that. So let's first talk about the census and city directories. So city directories as Ari articulated, it is really, really important uh, for 
filling in the gaps between those census years, and they can offer preliminary names to start searching with. Uh, names of residents. Now, let's not forget that not every resident of your house necessarily owns your house. I know my house at different points, you're going to have renters living there, and that's okay. I, fly, I find it interesting to research everybody who either lived in the house or owned the house. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at both the census and the city directories. So uh, another thing to mention about the census Later census returns for larger cities and towns often included street names, uh, sometimes house numbers, but let's not forget the house numbers might change. But in the absence of a name cert, a name to actually search for in the census, uh, enumeration districts, figuring out what that is and then browsing the pages, that will help you. As far as maps go, the two kind of big ones you want to look for are the Sanborn fire insurance maps, as the previous presentation talked about. Uh, and if you don't live in a city or a community that has uh, over 250, well, 2,500 people living in it, I should say, if you're living outside of a city, you're going to want to look at flat maps. Uh, now, I do want to point out that it is important to look at multiple types of maps from a variety of years to see changes. Now, this map we're looking at, this uh, was actually created by this neighborhood, Williams Woodland Park, which we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, and this is what the boundaries of this neighborhood are today. So this neighborhood is a part of the National Historic Register. And here's the thing, Williams Woodland Park did not originally include all of this area. It was only these three blocks. But the next slide will kind of articulate what I mean by that. So this is from an atlas called Fort Wayne and the Environs. So this is from 1922. As we can see, we have Williams Wilden Park edition. So that's these three yellow lots right here. This section over here, in the kind of pinkish reddish color. Uh, this is actually the Williams edition. And we see we have these other editions right here. Now, why is this important? Why should we care? You should care only because you will see a difference in the legal descriptions of these lots. The house we're gonna end up talking a lot about today is actually right here. So it's actually lot 240 of the Williams edition, but today it's considered Williams Lytham Park but the legal description is Williams edition. I'll explain in a couple minutes why this is called Williams Woodland Park, but the reason why you wanna compare this map to other maps is because you might notice some changes. So as I said, this section was called the Williams edition. It was actually platted in 1887. This part over here in yellow was platted in 1898. So this was platted a little bit earlier. This was all part of the estate of Jesse Williams, who was the chief engineer of the Erie Wabash Canal. Uh, so this is part of his farm, basically. Uh, and one thing to kind of note is a difference between this plat, which came from the county recorder's office, and this atlas. We have two different street names. So the street names change. Even the oldest plat, uh, Sanborn map that shows this area it always shows West Woodland Avenue. So when did the change happen? Well, you can kind of figure it out by looking at some other maps and also looking at the newspaper. So 1898, so that's when Williams Grove became platted into Williams Woodland Park. This map was clearly done before 1898. So it was probably drawn before 1898, before this was actually platted. And notice this side, is Park Place, this side is Allen. Now, if you do a little searching in the newspaper, this is why newspapers are, are helpful, one of the many reasons, you'll see Allen Street and Park Place were changed in 1897. So again, using these tools together, you can kind of figure out what's going on and it can help you find more information if names change, right? 
But not just names changing, newspapers can also be a really great resource for finding real estate transfers and building permits and just information about the residents. Uh, you know, who lost their dog, right? Uh, who is maybe looking for a maid to move in? Who is maybe, um, you know, maybe getting into some trouble, maybe filing for bankruptcy? This is all really awesome information. Newspapers are an amazing resource for genealogy and for finding the genealogy of your house. So one kind of tip I like to bring up is when you're looking at the real estate transfer section of the newspaper, say you're not quite sure what it's going to look like as far as the legal description goes, you can just search real estate sales or real estate transfers to see what is the language being used in your local newspapers in a certain time period. And this will help you decide what search terms you should be using to get better search results. Sometimes it's the address, sometimes it's the lot number, and sometimes it's this crazy looking uh, description like lot 21 and east, and east five feet of lot 22. So again, you wanna get an idea of what the language is that they were using. Deeds, okay, so I could do a whole other presentation on just deeds. So I'm gonna to try to make it condense. Uh, where to find deeds? The first place I look is Family Search in the catalog. I do have instructions in the handout on how to get into the catalog to find deeds uh, and other online resources as well. If it isn't online, contact the county recorder's office. That's where those are probably going to live. So where do you start? What do you do with deeds? Collecting the deeds, just finding all the deeds you can for a property, this will help you establish a firm chain of title. So what that means is who is it going from? So who is selling it, who is buying it, and so forth forever and ever and you know for all time. Uh, this will help gather names of potential owners uh, from the census, from the city directory, uh, from the newspapers. Those are people then go look for in the deed indexes, but we can't forget that not everyone who lived in the house necessarily owned the property. So what do you do if you have the name of an owner, specifically a grantee, to look for, but you're still unable to find an entry for the sale of the house in the county's deed, deed index? First, look for the real estate transfer announcements in the newspaper, because sometimes when the deeds um, so when the sale happened, the deeds were not always recorded immediately. Uh, I'm actually going to show you one example of a deed that was recorded almost like several months, like six months or more after it was actually sold. So it's not going to appear in the newspaper immediately. So look, look in the real estate transfer announcements in the newspaper and also just be patient. Uh, looking into deeds and finding deeds for specific properties, it can be hard. It could be challenging. And not every deed index is accessible. And not every deed index is easy to work with. Uh, it might take browsing an entire volume of the index a few times to actually find what you're looking for. And I know for me personally, when I have been looking for deeds for various houses in my neighborhood, at a certain point, you stare at the page or you know at the screen for so long everything looks the same take a break that is probably the best advice i can give you when you're struggling take a break and come back to it now i do want to say if you have a title abstract these are great um like i said not everyone has them but i do want to point out that they do exist and they usually will talk about the history of the lot from before it was platted and the various sales that are gonna go on until they end. So they're not, they weren't always done after a lot of the ones for Fort Wayne end in the 30s. Some, some people have some for the 50s or later, but it's not really practice that these uh, title companies are really doing anymore uh, unless you pay them lots of money to do an abstract for you. So you also really need to research the big picture, the local and historical context. 
So what's happening in the world, the state, the community during the time frame you're researching? And how might those things affect the residents of the house? So did somebody die in the house? Did some, was someone born in the house? Did they lose uh, their job? Did they get a new job? These are all things that might actually affect who's living there. They might take in borders if it's the depression. You know, what's going on? Where did they work? Right? Was this a working class community? Were they working at factories? That type of thing. As I said a second ago, what kind of joy or sadness could a family have experienced while living there? I know when I worked at the Tenement Museum, I frequently was asked by both children and adults, you know, is this building haunted? Probably yes, no more or less than any other old building that people lived in. Um, that particular building was built in 1863, and it was a residence until 1935. So yes, people died there, but people were born there. That's totally normal. And also, like uh, Ari had said when talking about the Sandborn maps, you know, you can look at a Sandborn map and see, you know, where were people maybe going to school? Where were the churches? Um, where did they go to work? Where was that in relation to where they're living and you know what could people be doing for fun was there like a like a, a movie theater near them so this can kind of give you an idea of maybe what did your residents what were their lives like looking at the local history of the neighborhood itself or just the settlement if it's we're talking about a, a rural community so as i said a couple minutes ago uh, the neighborhood we're going to talk about primarily is williams Woodland park in in fort wayne now this map right here, so this is the original plat for the area that used to be the park. So a little bit of context, uh, Jesse Williams, who is, as I said earlier, the chief engineer of the Erie Wabash Canal, he owned this big farm estate uh, in what is now the southern port of, uh, of Fort Wayne. Now, at one point they decided to create, the family created a park. It was three blocks in size, uh, and this private park, it was the one of the first private parks in Fort Wayne, uh, and they kept the family, tried to sell the park to the city several times for less than half of what the property was actually worth. The city didn't have an interest in it, in it and eventually Jesse Williams, uh, his widow and his heirs decided to have the lots platted in two lots, and then a local real estate developer named Lewis Curtis. He sold all these lots, these three. So we're talking these three blocks, I should say. So it's uh, about 60 lots. Sold them all in a lottery in one evening. Uh, this area was, you know, experiencing a, a massive housing boom. And this is a reflection of that. And also you want to talk to the house's current neighbors and just other people in the community. You have no idea some of the stories some of your neighbors might know, is particularly neighbors who have lived there a really long time. So where my parents live in Louisiana, uh, behind their house, there is a log house that was built by uh, former Louisiana governor, Edwin Edwards, who was rather infamous. Uh, he went to federal prison at one point. Uh, and at one point while he was governor, he had owned this house, and that's where he would take his lady friends. We would never have known that <laughs> uh, if we hadn't asked one of our neighbors who lived to be about 100 years old, uh, and she lived in the neighborhood forever. And she's like, oh, yeah, I remember when Edward, Ed Edward Edwards used to bring these women to that house. So again, you never know what kind of gossip and drama you can find just by asking the neighbors, assuming you get along with them. You can also look for physical clues. So this is my house. Uh, there's my my dog lurking. You can play spot the border collie during this portion of the, of the pr presentation. Um, so looking at physical clues of the house can also help date the house. So what my house is, is it's a Queen Anne style house, uh, more specifically a cross gabled L house if you wanna be specific. Uh, window size, uh, shape. 
style, that type of thing, that can kind of help date the house. Google is your friend when it comes to style. Uh, also, placement of windows are really helpful, where doors are located, the size of doors. Uh, interior woodwork and trim. Uh, the inside of my house it has a lot of the original woodwork in it, and that also helps date the house. Uh, and you want to also look for signs of change. So this is the story of three porch posts. So over here, front porch post number one, this is a replacement column that I believe is made out of aluminum that was put up in the 1990s. It was salvaged from another house uh, that was being torn down. Uh, the porch columns that were here were rotting and apparently the front porch, front porch was about to collapse. So that's what this is. But then also on the front porch, and you can see my dog here, uh, you have another style that is more akin to the late 19 teens, early 20s, but this house was built in 1900. So this is a little late in time for this house. And also, um, if you go back to the previous slide, there's a lot of space here. There should be a porch railing, but there isn't. Now, if you go to the back porch, you see a completely different style of porch post. It's a term post. We got this kind of gingerbread corbel situation going on. I believe that this is probably the original porch post. And the funny thing is that in the basement, we have a coal room because there would have been a coal furnace. And there's a support beam in that that's actually an old porch post that looks just like this one. So looking for signs of change that can also help you figure out, you know, what's going on with the house in a different, in certain time periods. This is also where sandbar maps can be very helpful because they can tell you the footprint of a house. So over here, we have the 1902 fire insurance map. We see the front porch. Now it looks like in the back, this was all one porch. You look at the back of the house, which is not particularly pretty, I'm sorry. Uh, it looks like they cut it in half. Now, we recently obtained uh, at the Allen County Public Library, the Allen County building permits, well, some of them, uh, and I was able to find a 1993 building permit application that shows when this was enclosed to create this half bathroom laundry room situation that admittedly has a lot of problems, but I digress. So while this isn't exactly up to scale or exactly matching this, it can give you an idea of maybe what choices were made at different time periods. Uh, I know that in this basement, there's never every, never any evidence that I've seen to show that there was a washer or dryer in the basement. So it's possible that they didn't have a washer and dryer in this house until 1993. So something to think about. So how would we use all these tools to find the story of a house? So when we're doing genealogy, right, when we're helping at the library, someone new with genealogy, we often suggest that they start with the census, more specifically, the most recent census. So this is the 1950 census. We're gonna take a closer look and see we have here, the house we're gonna talk about, which is 24, 06 South Harrison Street, which is not my house, so don't, don't go bother these people. Uh, you see William H. Carter, his son Herbert R. Carter, and there is a family of four renting the upstairs. So it says downstairs, upstairs. I've been in this house. Based on where the door frames are, based on where the walls are, these people had to have been very comfortable with one another because I don't believe any walls have moved and the staircase is in the middle of the house. So subdividing it this way is kind of interesting. And I think that they probably had to be rather chummy with one another. Now, the Carter family, they appear in city directories uh, going back to 1922. Now, Ari had showed a way of figuring out in my uh, in my heritage how to see other people who lived in a certain address uh, with the city directory collection on my heritage there's another way of doing it on ancestry that isn't perfect just because of 
OCR, but I do want to show you a way of getting around the not having a name to search in the city directories. Now, in Fort Wayne, the city directories don't have a reverse address lookup in the back until the mid-1920s. So there is, there is a way. Let's talk about that. So in this keywords section, you can put in the address. Um, you can, if it's a how it's if it's a street like South Harrison, you can either include this or not include it. Play with it, because really at the end of the day, what you're doing is trying to trick OCR, trick the optical character recognition to actually show you the things you want. Another thing I want to point out, just because a lot of people kind of forget that this box exists, you can browse a collection. Uh, if you don't have a name to search, you could just go to the state, go to the city, go to the year, and pick the thing that the year that you need. Um, but if there isn't a reverse address look up in the back, you're just going to be looking at every page. And I don't recommend doing that. But I do want to just point out that this exists. Now, as far as this keywords box go, you can either press exact or not. It's entirely up to you. Now, when you search for this, 2406 South Harrison, you get mostly the Carter family, except this lady, Ella, this is actually Ella Reed. This woman is the mother of Mrs. Nellie R. Carter. Nellie Carter was the wife of William H. Carter. So I wanted, wanted to know who else lived in this house besides the Carter family? Because I know that this house was not built in the 20s. So I went back and just started working backwards from the Carter family. So we have the 1930 census here. It's very faint. I know it's completely legible. I apologize. I tried to make it darker, but this is as good as it gets. But here we see William H. Carter, his wife, Nellie, his son, Herbert, and his mother-in-law. Mrs. Reed. Now, this column says that they own the house. Great. 1920 census. There's another family here. So we know that the family owned the house in 1930. They owned the house in the 20s, but not in 1920 itself. So who, who owned the house, right? Because these people are renters. We're going to get to that stage. I do want to talk a little bit about Sanborn maps. So I mentioned that house numbers change, and that is absolutely true in Fort Wayne. Now, when you get to a point where you're getting a little stuck, for Fort Wayne research at least, it is important to look to see, okay, what was the old address? Because maybe we're not finding it because it's under the old address. So the house numbers changed in Fort Wayne in 1902. And the easiest way to actually find what the old address is, is to look at the 1902 Sanborn map. So you, as mentioned in the previous presentation, you want to look at the index page, which is just the first page, oh, excuse me, the first page of the Sanborn map, and figure out what page you need to go to. So here we have the house that we're going to talk a little bit about. So a couple things to note. So we have the, the legend down here saying, you know, the, what type of house it is. So it's a wood framed house. It's two stories, the porch is one story, all that good stuff. You wanna make a note of the lot number. This number is the old address. So this is uh, 480 South Harrison. And the new address, 2406. Now, some people have asked before, why are there two numbers here, 2408, 2406? The best guess that myself and some of my colleagues can come up with is that in 1902, when the house numbers officially changed, that was after Sanborn drew the maps. So the maps were already drawn. They knew it was going to be one of two numbers, so they just put both. But you need all of these numbers to help you find the find the things you're looking for in both the deeds, the newspapers, the directories. Make a note of all the numbers. 
So knowing the old address, I went to newspapers.com. I put in 480 South Harrison. Now, I put this date range as 1900 to 1902, just because I knew that the house numbers changed in 1902. So I just, as an example, limited it to just those two years. But I do want to point out, don't forget to use alternate spellings, uh, add or include abbreviations, so south or south, like so S for south or write out south, or you could put SO for south if it's something like that. And you want to also search for the names of the residents that you're finding in the city directory. Now, this particular search query only came up with two matches. Uh, but this can kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. I do want to point out that this one down here, this is actually an error in the OCR. Uh, this is actually 496 or 498 South Harrison. So it can be wrong. Doing this, you have to play with it. Uh, like anything with newspaper research, it is tricking the OCR. So you need to play with it until you find what you're looking for. I do want to point this particular article out. Um, Lost Scotch Terrier Dog, one year old, reward for return of the same to 480 South Harrison Street. I can't tell you how many times I've researched a house in my neighborhood and I search the address in newspapers.com and pull up lost dog ads. I don't know what it is about the people in Williams Woodland Park losing their dogs, but apparently it's a thing. Another thing to do is look for real estate transfers. So as I said earlier in the program, uh, if you look at the real estate transfers, you can get an idea of what language is used. So this is just an example of some of those real estate transfers specifically for this time period. So if you're looking for a particular house in a particular time frame, like I said, you do want to look at how, what is the language used? Are they abbreviating addition like this? Uh, are they abbreviating it as like AD? Are they writing out addition? It entirely depends. And that's going to change almost yearly, at least for Fort Wayne. So you can search lot four in parentheses. Uh, so you have lot four together and you can search separately Farnan's edition in quotes. Uh, it's, it's entirely up to you, but like I said, it's just a matter of playing with it until you get it to give you what you want. Now, as Kim mentioned earlier, I'm originally from New Orleans. Uh, I did want to show an example just very quickly of real estate transfers from a different city. So you, this is for my grandmother, Winifred Gonzalez Dolan. This is when she was selling off parts of my great grandfather's estate, different properties he owned. But notice this is actually the address. So South Salcedo Street, 121 to 23. So how it looks depends on the newspaper, depends on the year. So that's why it's important to look at the real estate transfer section just to get an idea of language. So back to the house on South Harrison Street. So when I started doing some research in the city directories, I discovered when I've, that the first family I could find in the city directory living at 480 South Harrison Street, so the 1902 city directory, was Herman T. Simon and his wife, Matilda. So I started searching for Matilda Simon and Herman T. Simon in the newspaper, and then I struck gold. I finally found a real estate transfer from Patrick E. Cox to Matilda L. Simon, or Seaman, whichever, um, lot 240 Williams edition for $4,500. Great. So then I wanted to find the deed. So I went to Family Search. Now, the deeds for Allen County on Family Search, they end in 1901. The deed index goes to 1902. So at least if I could find it in the index, maybe I can find it at the recorder's office, which is exactly what I did. So I did find the transaction in the index. 
And then I had to go to the recorder's office. So our recorder's office, they do have some deeds digitized on their website. You have to pay a kind of an insane fee uh, to use this records hub thing. And that's how I was able to find it. So here we have the real estate transfer and then we have the deed itself. A lot of this is boilerplate information. Uh, basically just says that Patrick Cox, he's a widower. Uh, he sold the property for $4,500 to Matilda Simon and her husband and her heirs uh, forever. Uh, but we'll get into some of this boilerplate legal jargon uh, in a couple minutes. So we know that they bought the house in July of 1901. But by 1910, they're gone. They are not living in the house anymore. We have another family, Fred C. Long, who was renting the property. So what happened? Where did the Simons go? So just as a comparison, I wanted to compare the first city directory they appear in and some of the last ones they appear in, in Fort Wayne. So here they are in 1902, Herman T. Simon. He was working at Simon Brothers, which was actually a book paper wallpaper store that his father had owned, uh, living at four, uh, 2406 in parentheses, 480, so the old address, South Harrison Street, great. All of these until 1907 look about the same until we see that he has a new job. He's a travel agent. So he's not working for his father's business. So Herman Simon, he had been running this business with his brother. His father passed away years prior. And so I was then wondering, what, what's going on here? What's going on with the business? Because by the following year, we see that the Simons had removed to Grand Rapids, Michigan. After a little digging in the newspaper, I discovered that the bookstore had filed for bankruptcy. Uh, it's kind of interesting to note that it says that the personal liabilities of the partners, so Herman and his brother, are trivial. Neither owns real estate, which was not entirely true. Uh, they did; He did own his house through his wife, but he owned his house. Um, another kind of interesting thing to note is that one of his creditors, Mead C. Williams, that is one of the children of Jesse Williams, uh, the, the family that created the neighborhood that he was living in. So just kind of interesting connections to make. So this happens in 1906. The following year, in July of 1907, the family moves to Grand Rapids. So I then start looking through the deed index, trying to find uh, when they sold the house, because I thought it had to have been 1907. It had to have been 1907. Well, I was wrong. After scouring the deed index and the newspaper, I finally discovered that they did not sell the house until 19, 1913. So they're using it as a rental property for extra income for several years. So in May of 1913, they sell the property to a woman named Margaret Ditto for $3,000. So $1,500 less than what they paid for. Now, Margaret Ditto, she owned a grocery store uh, and a number of rental properties. She never lived in the house. Uh, and immediately after buying the house, she did try to sell it, but she didn't. It didn't sell. I saw ads in the newspaper asking for a quick sale, but she never, she didn't sell it for another nine years. So by 1922, she has to sell because she has to file for bankruptcy. Uh, Margaret Ditto is someone who I've been on and off researching for a little while. My understanding is that she was a widow, but she was also suing people all, all over town at different points. So I'm kind of wondering if maybe she was kind of drowning in legal fees, and that might be why she then had to file for bankruptcy. So she filed for bankruptcy, and the house was then sold at auction. So this is just part of the deed from when her house was sold at auction. Uh, this is like a three page long deed record. And a lot of it has to do with her bankruptcy stuff. A uh, couple things to know. We have the date of when she was a judge bankrupt. 
and we have the name of the attorney who is appointed and qualified as the trustee of her estate. So when looking for this in the deed index, I actually had to look for his name to, act, to actually find the deed. So when a house is declared bankrupt, or at least in this time frame in Fort Wayne, a couple things need to happen. First, the house needs to be appraised. Then the house needs to be advertised in the newspaper. And then we see here in this blue box, it went to auction and Nellie R. Carter, who's the wife of William H. Carter, who I mentioned earlier, she bought the house for $4,700, which was the highest bid offered. And it was less than 75% of the appraised value of the premises. So they bought the house at auction. This is just more boilerplate information in the deed. Um, this stuff is talking about the, um, the bankruptcy situation for Margaret Ditto, but it is basically saying that the Carters now own the house. Now the Carter family, they own this house. They were the longest residents and owners of this house. So they moved in in 1922 and they continued to live in the house until their son, Herbert Carter died in 1979. Uh, when Herb Carter died, uh, he had never been married. Uh, he was kind of, he was a bachelor, didn't have kids. Uh, I actually met someone who knew her partner uh, as a kid and used to cut the grass for him. And we were actually both standing in this house when he was telling me this. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm the one who found him when he died. And I'm pointing to this part of the floor and was like, yeah, when I came in, I came in to get money to cut his grass and he was dead right there. So again, this is why asking the neighbors, you get some interesting stories. Um, but he had no heirs. So the house was put up for auction by the estate and was then sold many times over uh, and eventually fell into disrepair. And then someone you know, renovated it and restored it. So the question I then have, once I got to this whole point with the Carters, I wanted to know who owned the property before the Simons, since they are, seem to be the first owners of the house, first residents of the house. But I also wanted to know, uh, when was the house actually built, right? So I was able to, I started researching Patrick Cox. So Patrick Cox, he purchased the lot or the property in 1901. So he got it from the Gordon Kurtz company. So this is what that deed looks like. And there are a couple of things I do want to point out about this particular deed. So at the beginning, you're going to have who is selling it? So the Gordon Kurtz Company, a corporation, it has the name of the president, Irving Gordon, and the secretary, William Kurtz. So these people actually lived in Indianapolis at the time. Uh, they sold it for $1,300 to Patrick Cox. Now, when you look at things like this, it's important to keep some context clues in mind. So this was in... 19, uh, 1900, right? But in 1901, the Simon family, they bought it for $4,500. Given the mass housing boom in this time frame and the fact that there is no recorded resident of the property until the Simon family, it seems really unlikely that Patrick E. Cox would mark up the resale value so high unless he had purchased an empty lot and then built the house. Another thing I want to point out about the deed is that, so we have the legal description, lot number 240 in the Williams edition. So again, this is boilerplate legal jargon, but it's adjustable boilerplate legal jargon. I do recommend, you know, reading these because sometimes they'll include extra information like, you know, the existence of a shed or something, um, things like that. This blue box has to do with uh, street and sewer assessments from 1900. Uh, notice the date is July 31st, 1900. So that's when this sale happened. It was notarized on this date, but it wasn't recorded until April of 1901. So things like this 
is why it can be difficult to sometimes find a deed because you think that it was sold at one point, but it might not show up in, in the actual deed books until a little bit later. I was able to find a building permit for the house as well. So Patrick E. Cox, he um, took out a building permit saying that the house was going to cost about $2,000 to build. So this was in October of 1900. Another thing I wanted to do is trace a lot back to the Williams family. Uh, so to go back to Jesse Williams, well, really the family. So we know that the, uh, the Gordon Kurtz company in 1896 they purchased the lot from a woman named Edna Kuntz. So Edna Kuntz and her husband, George Kuntz, uh, they paid only $800 for the lot. So basically you have these people who are speculating with the real estate market. They're buying up these empty lots in this area that was developing and then just holding on to lots and reselling them for a higher value. People do that all the time. People do that now. Uh, so we see here at the top, legal description, um, this title, so conveyed, is clear and free and clear, basically. Basically, what this means is that no one else is going to show up out, coming out of the woodwork wanting, like saying that this is their property, right? So it's free and clear to sell. And this old, uh, the 17th day of August, 1896. We have the date it was notarized, the date it was recorded. So make a note of all these dates. And then Williams to Koontz. So this is when Edna Koontz and her husband bought it from the, the Williams family. So this is the children of Jesse Williams. Now, this deed is a little unusual because you're going to have all these people living in different places. So this is we're getting close to the end. I want to make sure we have time for, for questions. Okay, so this is what it looks like a little zoomed in. We have Edward P. Williams and his wife, Abby, Meetsy Williams and his wife, Elizabeth, Henry Williams and his wife, Mary Hamilton Williams. They sold it for $700 to Edna Coots and her husband and her heirs. Uh, again, this is just legal jargon of the legal description, law number uh, two, 240, Williams edition. Uh, this has to do with taxes. Uh, this is sometimes important to look at because if they owe a bunch of taxes, that might be a factor as to why a property is being sold. So here we have Henry Williams and his wife, Mary Hamilton Williams, they're the only people actually living in Allen County at the time of this sale in 1894. So they sell, they notarize this uh, January 19th, 1894. And then his brother, Edward P. Williams and his wife, Abby, they are in the state of New York. So they're living in New York, January 11th, 1894. And then in Missouri, in St. Louis, we have Mead C. Williams and his wife, Elizabeth. They're getting their document notarized in January of 1894. And then you'll see at the bottom, recorded February 2nd, 1894. So it takes a while when you have all these people in different states who are then having to sign over the deed. So just to wrap up, we have a timeline here that I created. Uh, this is the most condensed version of this timeline that exists. I have other ones that are longer that include residents who are not owners. But this is some of the things you can do when you gather all this information together. Just to recap, final tips. Make a note of all the relevant house numbers. Use maps. <laughs> Check the language used in the real estate transfer section of the newspaper. Finding deeds often requires using many tools like the census, the city directories, and the newspapers together in order to find the deeds. But don't be afraid to do a little bit of a little family tree for the residents of the house. Because sometimes the people who are buying these lots 
our relatives. Uh, I was researching a house in the neighborhood recently where the father-in-law bought the property for his daughter. Uh, and But then when you get around to the time of the sale, he was dead. So the sale is happening under the name of this woman and her husband. So it puts everything into context. So with that, I know we are running a little short on time for questions. So I'm going to reappear and see if there are any. There are. I always take a minute to appear like a genie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as I told everyone, I've heard this talk before and damn it if I don't have more of an action note to take. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's, All right. it's always such a big topic to fit into a small amount of time. It, this could be many different presentations. <laughs> well, it creates that aha moment, and especially with me in the process of buying a home. It's like, I know he bought it from a farm to develop these condos, you know, so yeah. I've got a list of questions to ask my realtor for. Yeah. Anyways, let's get to those questions. The first one is from my friend, Susan, who would like to know where you look for title abstracts. Other than the county courthouse, is there a place, I mean, is this something that Family Search is doing? Is there like a general site to go to? Or? So it kind of depends. So like we have some for Fort Wayne. Um, people who live in Fort Wayne bring us their title abstracts and we scan them and put them on our website. Um, they're not easy to find. If the county courthouse doesn't have them, um, and you can't find them like in the deeds, like in the records, uh, the land and property records on family search, you might not find them. Some people just have theirs. Uh, I know a couple of people who live in older houses in Fort Wayne that have inherited with the house an old title abstract that dated, it was probably done in the 1930s because that's when the last resident, last owner is listed. So it kind of, kind of depends. I know when I reached out to a, a county courthouse, they said I had two options. Come sit in their vault, do it yourself, yeah. or pay $300 to a title abstract company. Yeah. So let's move on. Um, so can an AI write an abstract? And we were doing a test behind the scenes Mm -hmm. And basically what comes up is what you find like with Zillow, real estate companies, yeah. whatever. So that answers that unless you have something. I different. think if you created like a bullet, like a bullet point list, basically of the chain of title then and maybe. asked it to create an abstract for you, it probably can. Um, let's see. How do you find the address in the census without knowing the name of the people who live there? So it depends on the census year. Let me see if I can go back to a slide that has that. Um, depending on the census year, you will have on the side the street. Yeah. You might have the house number, but it depends on the census year and depends on where we're talking about. If we're in a city, you're more likely to see that if you're in a rural community, not necessarily. Yeah. yeah. There's no way to shortcut going page by page. No. Now this is um, one that's right up your alley. Um, would lot numbers in the 1800s search work for New Orleans, um, Louisiana? I have several properties to track and was. Was there more than one square? I search a person. It, my search person is John Leonard Riddle. I uh, Some properties were businesses. So for the 1800s in New Orleans, what's your best advice? Newspapers. And contact the New Orleans Public Library. They might have some better suggestions, um, but I would start with newspapers. Let's see how smart you are. I just said, go to New Orleans and have some bidets first. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Can you find land ownerships 
in a similar similar way and how. So I guess maybe for farms class, I'm not sure. Yeah. Of the question. Yeah. Um. Because I mean, for for a farm, for just land, you're you're looking at deeds the same way. Yeah. Um. But you need to figure out you know what what is the legal description so this is where the names are going to be important because if you don't know the legal description necessarily if you know the name of people who own the land so looking at a plat map that might have some names on it yeah that can help you then find the deed and then you know what the legal description is um let's see it says how will i find who owned a property 50 years ago in new mexico um, how was the land inherited? Again, would you recommend just going to the community, the city, the historical society, the yeah. New Mexico archives? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, yeah. Um, then an, another one. Uh, what was the address again on the Harrison house? My grandfather lived at 1312 North Harrison in 1921. Oh, this is going to be several block, blocks south. It's a uh, 2406. Okay. South Harrison. Yeah. And then can you search EDs by address in Steve Morrison's one step that you will link to a census page for a street address? Steve Morris's website does have a street finder. Okay. Yeah, which I see that someone put that in the in the chat. Okay. Love when y'all do that. <laughs> so that is it for questions. Let me just check real quick. So I think that's everything. I'll tell you though, if you've never done a house research project, it is wonderful. I did one for my mother and uh, her house that she fondly remembers in Michigan City, Indiana. Mm -hmm. she still looked at it up until the time of her death of course the house is no longer there it's the parking lot of the post office but what's interesting about that is I probably should write it up for the Michigan City Historical Society because I was reading an article out of the Denver Public Library about what they call house obits for mm -hmm. homes that no longer exist oh okay you know, and it was like such an interesting concept, you know, whether your family lived there or not, for whatever reason. And um, so yeah. just a thought. No, that's um, cool. Now, let me ask, because I'm asking every speaker the same question. If someone thinks of that wonderful burning question three days later, can they email you as long as you're not doing the research? Yeah, uh, I would suggest that they email uh, the library. So I'll put okay. the email in the chat. It's genealogy at acpl.info. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, they're not going to do research for you. The best thing is visit the Mecca, mm -hmm. schedule an appointment with a librarian. They are so friendly and that, and they're also easily bribed. Um <laughs> So I see someone put in about the New Orleans Public Library. So whoever asked that question, there's that uh, information. Uh, Elizabeth put in her email. 